I've got many hats, but honestly, this one's all I need. In case it hasn't hit you yet, I love boss battles. When the pieces are set right, they're exciting, they test your skills, and they're just fun. So when a boss comes along that rubs me the wrong way, I take notice. Just like commentators notice when I screw up. So these are the bosses that pissed me off the most. Some bosses may look bad or have bad atmosphere, but for me, gameplay is the biggest factor that makes or breaks a boss fight. Basically, if I didn't have fun with it, it's gonna find itself in the crosshairs. Also, I'll be spoiling a few games, so I'll make a note if a recent game is being spoiled. Take notes, video game developers who may or may not be watching this. These bosses are examples of doing it wrong. It's game time! Custom Robo, an overlooked series featuring fast-paced action and plenty of options for combat. Heck, if Nintendo and the general gaming public gave a shit, it could probably make for some good esports. At least then we wouldn't have to deal with crap like the final battle with Rahu. Throughout the game, you have a few encounters with this mysterious menace, and each time, it just gets worse and worse. First off, let's talk about illegal parts. In story, they're forbidden because they put exorbitant strain on the commander. In game, they're illegal because they're far more powerful than your standard part. All three times you fight Rahu, he's armed to the teeth with some of the most powerful illegal parts in the game. That alone puts you at a disadvantage, but it gets worse. In the final battle, you're paired up with Marsha and Harry, and as expected for partner AI in this game, they suck. Rahu himself is ridiculously powerful, durable, and agile all at once, so fighting against him one-on-one -on -one is much harder than your standard opponent. Especially when you consider that he recovers IMMEDIATELY after being knocked down, complete with the invincibility frames that come with it. I'd rather face a human opponent than this guy. At least then I know that I'm being straight up outplayed. There's challenging, and then there's just outright cheap. Keep that in mind, we'll be seeing more of that. With a series like Monster Hunter that prides itself on its giant beasts, you'd probably imagine that there's at least one monster that's a pain to fight. I can think of a few right off the bat, but the most irritating I faced is the Kizu. Now this thing was introduced in the original game, but this is going off of my experience in Monster Hunter 4 Ultimate. And whenever I entered the Frozen Seaway, this is the monster I always dreaded facing. Why? For one thing, its movements are highly erratic, mainly when it extends that Mr. Fantastic neck of his. Also, it can climb on the walls and ceilings. Now, when it's on the walls, it can be knocked down with your knife. Not so much on the ceiling. Being a melee specialist, whenever it climbs up there, my teeth clench almost subconsciously. But then the beast busts out the thunder. It's bad enough that the lightning field it emits can start up when you're delivering an attack and can't dodge, but sometimes it does a second one right after the first one finishes. This is especially aggravating when you're trying to mount it, because you're not invincible when you're in the air. Also, it and a couple charging attacks cause Thunder Blight, which increases the chances of you getting stunned. And then there's the lightning balls it shoots, which can paralyze you. Combine that with the aforementioned Thunder Blight, and you could end up getting stun-locked to death. I don't care how jacked you are, no amount of flexing can make this beast bearable. The Sonic series tends to have the bad boss Bullseye on its back, whether it's the Time Eater, Silver, Iblis, take your pick. As for me, the worst Sonic boss I faced is the first Sonic boss I faced. Yeah, great impression, am I right? The boss of Underground Zone, the first zone in the Game Gear version of Sonic 2, should not have been the boss to open the game with, or at the very least, should have been better designed. The idea is that this ant lion is waiting at the bottom of the hill while cannonballs bounce down at random speeds. You can't damage the thing. The cannonballs can. The issue is that it's usually hard to see the cannonballs coming before it's too late. Making matters worse is the fact that there are no rings in the Act 3 stages in this game, meaning one mistake and your short one hedgehog. That includes making the mistake of hitting down on the D-pad. Perhaps the biggest issue in this fight is the Game Gear screen itself. The Master System version of this fight has a larger visible area, meaning you can see the cannonballs more easily. However, with the lower resolution of the Game Gear, you can't see as much of the screen, and as a result, it's hard to see where the next cannonball will come from. Gotta love that Game Gear screen crunch, am I right? In a series like No More Heroes that lives and dies by its boss battles, the stinkers really smell. 
And trust me, there are plenty of those. Now, I've ragged on Jasper Bad Jr. before, including his horrific boss fight, and yeah, it sucks, but I can't call it the worst boss in the same game where New Destroy Man exists. Whether you love or hate Destroy Man to begin with, you can't deny, this boss is crap. The first problem is that it's two against one. I guess not only did being split down the middle by Travis in the first game not quite take, but apparently he also identifies as a cyborg amoeba that can reproduce asexually. Huh. Now, with the way that the Destroy Men coordinate their attacks, one of them will be assaulting you with melee and AoE attacks, while the other one takes pot shots at you from across the freaking map. Not only that, but they have, you guessed it, a combined attack that can do a ton of damage. Worse yet, when the melee user goes down, the Flying Sniper will come to the rescue. On the one hand, that's a big opportunity to attack, but that's little help when the remaining Destroy Man can revive his partner, making you repeat the process all over again. And if you interrupt him, he'll just fly away, take another pot shot at you, and swoop in and try again, and again, and again. Talk about a contrast to the first game, in that fight he was a joke. And the icing on the cow pie? You're playing as Shinobu. It's bad enough that her platforming is janky as hell and she taunts at the end of every combo, but because Suda51 is such a mad genius, he gave her two of the most annoying bosses in the game. <sighs> the things you go through to get Senpai to notice you. Oh look, a boss from Skyward Sword is on the list. Go on, take a guess who it is. Well, to be fair, I'm not just gonna slap the Imprisoned on here and just call it a day. Instead, I'm singling out the second fight with this thing. My thoughts on this fight can be summed up with one question. Why did it take until Breath of the Wild for a 3D Zelda game to have a goddamn jump button? Not only does the Imprisoned have more toes to cut off during the second fight, but the shockwaves that it emits with every step make it a pain just to cut them. Granted, it could use the shockwaves in the first fight, but in that fight they only came with an intentional attack. Making things worse is the addition of those arms of his. Not only do they get in the way of you getting around to the ceiling spike when you knock him over, but there's the slight insignificant matter of HE CAN CLIMB UP THE WALLS! Not even the addition of the Grusinator can help this fight, especially when it throws in more of Skyward Sword's infamous Force tutorials, when the controls for the damn thing are pretty much self-explanatory and easy to figure out. Okay, I sealed him up again. How long until he breaks out again? Fuck my life. If there's one thing that Kingdom Hearts usually does really well, it's boss fights. The final bosses in particular are some of the best in video game history. Ansem's outlandish design and fun challenge, and Xemnas' battle which tests everything you've learned in the game stand out in particular. The point I'm trying to make is, GOD DAMN WAS YOUNG Xehanort A PAIN IN THE ASS! The typical flow of a boss fight is to exploit any opening that you can get. The problem is that young Xehanort hardly gives you an opening to begin with. He's constantly attacking you with lightning-fast combos that are difficult to dodge and can take you from full health to kill in a matter of seconds. Also, if you manage to wear down his health, he retreats into this weird clock and you have to perform a reality shift on it. And even that's not the end of it. Now you'll have to destroy the clock for good, which is still easier said than done when you consider that his clones will be coming at you from every direction and will likely prevent you from getting close, if not kill you outright. And if you take too long with the clock in either case, he will rewind the battle, gaining back a third of his health and making you go through the same painful process all over again. It's bad enough that the fight is annoying as hell normally, but when it can possibly last forever, that crosses the line. At least the actual final boss, Armed Ventus Nightmare, is better. Somewhat. Four hours. Four fucking hours on a single boss. Not how I'd want to spend an afternoon. But if you want to do a 100% run of Final Fantasy XII, you'd better clear a good chunk of time in your schedule to take on Yee's Mat. Why am I a one of a good number of people who hates this boss? Well, let's start with that abnormous health bar in the corner. Each of those little segments represents over 1 million HP. And there's 50 of them. That's right, this boss has over 50 million HP. And considering that the most damage you can do in a single hit is 9,999, which is lowered to 6,999 halfway through the fight, I'll spare you the calculations and just say that it takes over 6,000 hits to kill it. You think that's bad? Throw in the fact that the fight takes place in an arena that's littered with traps that can inflict nasty status ailments on your party. 
It also doesn't help that Yizmat can also inflict insta-death on your party members and can increase its power and buff itself as the fight drags on. And to top it all off, it casts Refletka in the final stages of the fight. And it's not simply offensive spells that get reflected, oh no. It can also reflect healing spells. And if Renew gets reflected off of the party, it will heal Yizmat to full health, effectively rendering all your hard work completely wasted. The only saving grace of this fight is that there's a save point just outside of the arena, so that you can save, heal, fully restock, and jump right back in with little to no progress lost. If that weren't there, I'd have to waste an entire day just to defeat one boss. I've got things to do with my life, game! One of the most interesting additions that Arcana Heart 3 Love Max added over vanilla was Trial Mode. In this mode, you are put through a series of increasingly difficult challenges, ultimately leading to a fight with... <laughs> yeah, as if Paris weren't already bad enough. I hate how she can combo you for tons of damage seemingly without effort. I hate how her gauges refill at such ridiculous rates compared to everyone else. I hate how she teleports constantly, giving you hardly any chances to actually hit her. And since I'm using the old trope of repetition to reinforce a point, I hate, 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 hate her ability to regenerate her health at a whim! Remember how in vanilla she started losing health after the third loss? Welp, no such luck here. The game is through taking pity on you. You were good enough to make it this far, now you're on your own. <sighs> thanks a lot, game. Ready to combo her? You'd better throw out a super quick, or she'll burst you and you're back to square one. She hits you with Berserk, you'd better pray to Palatina you can knock her out before it wears off, or all the damage that got negated will be dealt to you all at once. Trying to wait out her constant supers? You'd better be ready to pounce on her if the last one whiffs, or she'll gain it all back within seconds, ready to ravage you again. Relying on your Arcana attacks? You'll have to wait out her Extend Force, which renders all Arcana attacks useless. To Paris Elsia, every single mistake is an invitation to pain and suffering. In fact, Nobody I know has a definitive strategy for beating her besides pure luck. Fighting game bosses are cheap by nature, but Paris will only go down when the computer decides to let you win. Which is about as likely as me winning EVO. Nearly 700 attempts later, yes, I've kept count, and I still haven't beaten her in Love Max, and it only took me 23 in vanilla. This is the only boss on this entire list that I still haven't beaten properly. Someday, Paris. Someday. Oh look, another countdown maker ragging on Disciple Arithia from Xenoblade Chronicles. When I first fought Larithia, I hated this fight because I died once or twice for seemingly bullshit reasons. But knowing what I know now, I still hate this fight because the pieces were set for a fantastic and thrilling fight for Melia, but the execution was downright abysmal. The first problem with this fight is the fact that when the fight starts, Larithia has 100% physical resistance meaning that only Aether attacks will harm her unless you kill up to three of the Nova she spawns, which also are weak to Aether. While Ricky and Number 7 have a few Aether arts, the best Aether user by far, Melia, is also the squishiest unless you gem her up properly, and the way her magic works is admittedly rather awkward. Now, shifts in gameplay style aren't necessarily bad. In fact, if done well, they can make for some amazing boss fights. But the way it was handled here just doesn't work well. Now, if that were the only problem with this fight, I'd have put Jadeface on the list instead, but we are just getting started. First off, those Novas? They can cause status effects and lower your defense, and if all of them die, Larithia will just summon a fresh set. Larithia herself is huge compared to the arena, hits like a tank, and can cause effects like Art Seal, which for Melia is a curse, Confusion, which is always a pain, and possibly the worst in this case, Topple. I say in this case, because the relatively small arena is surrounded by hazardous ether. If you fall in, you lose quite a bit of health getting out, and if your teammates fall in, they're likely to die since A, they emphasize fighting over not dying, and B, calling them to you doesn't always work. Preparing for this fight requires either extensive research or extensive trial and error. Either way, it's just not a well-designed fight. At least in the end we get some heartwarming closure for Melia, if not a bit tear-jerking. Poor Melia. Alright, before we get to number one, here are some dishonorable mentions. Bowser from New Super Mario Bros. 2. Boring and uninspired boss fight is boring and uninspired. The Queen Metroid from Metroid Other End. I want to fight the boss, not her constant minions. Nick Tilger from Yeast Origin. Great game, but this boss is downright noxious. Pyrivet from Kirby Triple Deluxe. 
stop hiding in the background, you lousy frog! And Magaki from the King of Fighters 11. If I wanted bullet hell, I'd play some Toho. Gate from Mega Man X6 was an interesting villain with a lot of potential. He designed the Nightmare Investigators, created the Nightmare Virus from Zero's DNA, and basically set a plot in motion to get revenge on a world that didn't appreciate his work. He's basically the closest that the X-Series got to Dr. Wily. Naturally, this is the kind of villain from whom you'd expect an epic and satisfying battle. And considering we've reached the number one segment, you can probably figure out that what I got instead WAS UTTER HELL! There's no excuse. There's just no excuse. I can't think of a single reason that a fight with such a promising villain should be this atrocious. I can think of several reasons why it's atrocious. In fact, the fight with Gate is a step-by-step -step example of how to screw over a good villain. Step 1. Make the arena annoying. Start with a bottomless pit and several small platforms. The smaller, the better. Step 2. Give the boss attacks that mess with you in the worst ways possible. How about those orbsy fires? They'll do nicely. They do stuff like fire smaller shots, slowly home in on you, draw you towards them, release those nightmare things, and even slow you down. And sometimes he releases three or four of them at a time. Step 3. Make the boss impervious to all your weapons. Gate will just float all over the place, and your weapons will just do fuck all to him. So how are you supposed to damage him? Well, refer back to Step 2. Those orbs release clouds of energy when destroyed, and they're the only way to damage him. Problem is, they can damage you too, so unless you position yourself just right, you'll be putting yourself in harm's way just to damage this guy. Step 4. Have the boss be inconsistent in how often you have a chance to actually damage him. Gate will only release orbs after floating towards your location, but he won't do it every time. This essentially turns the fight into a test of patience and frustration. Step 5. Give him an attack that limits your options even further. Like destroying your platforms once he hits half health. And you'll want to stay away from those platforms when they regenerate or risk an instant kill. Follow all these simple steps, and you too can piss me off! Oh, and to add insult to injury, he's not even the final boss! No sooner do you defeat him than LOL Sigma out of nowhere! And after going through Gates' hellborn gauntlet of a lab and enduring his annoying, tedious, and infuriating boss fight, Sigma is pathetically easy! But what personally hurts me the most is the nagging fear that Gate will ultimately be remembered for this shitty-ass boss fight instead of his potential as a villain. And that's just sad. I'm the Quarter Guy, and while I will admit I enjoy X6 to a point, I won't deny that there are a lot of problems with it. The botched localization, the crappy level design, the poorly implemented nightmare system... Stuff like this is the reason why I can only consider X6 to be a guilty pleasure, instead of... you know... good. <laughs> So, the King of Fighters 14 is out and SNK wants to prove that they're relevant again. Okay guys, you want me to be honest? Let's hope you haven't forgotten what made you relevant in the first place. Need a reminder? Let me give you one. You can thank me later. Just make sure you can still deliver the goods. Next time, Top 10 Neo Geo Games! It's game time! And here we are again at ye old fashioned end card doohickey. Hope you all enjoyed the video. Feel free to leave your feedback in the comments. As always, if you want to see more, there's the annotations to check out my other countdowns and my 25 cents worth, my weekly unscripted series. I'm also active on social media, and I do stream on Twitch from time to time. Also, there's a link to my Patreon if you want to get in on some cool stuff and support my channel at the same time. Thanks again, and until next time, this is The Quarter Guy, signing out!